Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Select Board. April 3rd, 2023. Time is 6.30. And today, our first order of business is approval of the minutes of March 27th. A motion to approve the minutes for March 27th. Seconded. Okay, we have a motion made and seconded to approve the minutes as presented. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Jeffrey, 3 0. Uh, next up is we have on the new business, we have legislative updates with Representative Natalie. Welcome. Natalie, welcome to Sunderland. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's all good saying that. <laughs> but that's how we used to always say it to Steve. And I still have my post office box here. All right. Time, so. All right. <laughs> Welcome to maybe. Sunderland. <laughs> did they make, did, if you give, Jeff will uh, um, sign your, if you want, yeah, for coming over the bridge, okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll reduce the fee for Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We validate. <laughs> Natalie? Well, I'm just here, so every, you know, I, I try to make it a, a regular thing for me to come and meet with select boards just to hear what's on your mind uh, and make sure that you know, what I'm talking about on Beacon Hill is uh, reflective of what's top of mind for you. So I think we're, we've hit nearly all 17 communities plus the mayor of Greenfield now. I think I have two more left after some of them. So I just wanted to, to set aside this time. Uh, I did print out for all of you a packet of the 39 bills that I introduced this session. Um, we're about ready to, the hearings have just begun. Um, we were given our committee assignments last month. Uh, I still I remain on ways and means, and right now we're in the process of the statewide budget hearings. One, Tomorrow in Springfield, and then one in Boston on Friday. The one on Friday will be the last one. Um, I'm also, I remain on the Transportation Committee. I remain on Tourism, Arts, and Culture. And then the, my, my Vice Chair assignment is actually something that's pretty exciting to me, and I think is great for the district. Uh, last session, the Joint Committee was on Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture. They've actually peeled off agriculture and separated it into its own joint committee on agriculture. Uh, so I'm really happy to be serving as vice chair of that new committee that I think is a, a reflection of the good work that we've all been doing to really lift up the importance of agriculture, farms, and our local food system in the Commonwealth. Uh, Senator Comerford is also serving on that committee on the Senate side. Um, Senator Gobi is also on that committee, and then on the House side, the chair is uh, Rep. Paul Schmidt from Westport on the Southwestern Senate. So that's, uh, those are my committee assignments. Uh, you have legislation that I've introduced in front of you, and I'm going to use the opportunity to hear from you. Nathaniel? Um, the big thing on our plates has been uh, school funding. Um, one of the items on there was School choice is $5,000 per student, which it's been for, I think, 35 years or something like that. And the cost per student is quadruple that at this point. And so if you can get that addressed, that'd be lovely. Um, in addition to that, um, tr school transportation is a huge thing in this area. Yeah. Um, not so much for us as other districts, but that's definitely something that's, you know, especially with Frontier, is, is more prevalent here than it would be in the eastern part of the state. <laughs> That's it for me, okay. Crystal. Do you have anything? I'm all set. It's just so. So a couple things. Um, one is, I think it's important that we keep when Mass Highway does a job in town mm -hmm. that we maintain that communications with them. And, and we we have, but sometimes um, some of our businesses, our residents talk about um, not staying up to date on that. So I, they usually do a pretty good job with us. So, but if we could just maybe
keep that in whenever we're doing a project if we can just keep that out in front and they and we're in particular we're talking about the center intersection yeah. out here we know that we think that they have plans they've been telling us they kind of have plans but how quick it moves sometimes it gets things happen real quick wouldn't you say lauren um, I think they're aware that the town wants to step back and explore full options that we kind of never really got to look at. But it's a little, it does sometimes feel like that process is somewhat detached from the input of the town. Okay. So, so I'd like we're to. We're not too embarked on a visioning study uh, project for the center of town. We have money and we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. and we just we're obviously going to include DOT, yeah. but we do want to be sure that, you know, there's that communication. Okay. So I, I, that's important. Um, Nathaniel had talked about school choice, the monies for school choice. I think that's a, a concern, but it's a concern for us in the Cape and not, not, not basically across Western Mass. I mean, Western Mass is a concern, but not across the entire state. So we're still stuck back in 93, 1993, money's coming back and $5,000 a student hasn't changed since that initial thing. So it'd be interesting to talk about. But I also think that we, we all, we, we look at our percentage of budget that goes to education and it's 70%. We say 70, 67, 68, so 60, 65 to 70% typically out here. And, and we're not throwing health costs into that. So I, I think that that's, and it'd be interesting to compare what the communities in the East, what their total budgets are with education, you know, what percentage education side there to their budget. I don't think a town should have to spend more than, and I'm picking a number, I'm not saying it's the right number wrong, but 50% of our expenses so you can say you you're the state's going to pay thirty dollars a student or forty dollars or fifty dollars but sometimes when you try to make everything equal you lose fairness out of that quotient and i don't think it's fair so for 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 us to be paying 70 percent i think that's a little on the hard side i i also think and I know we're, we're not supposed to have any unfunded mandates. That being said, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of bureaucracy that comes with some of the changes. And because we're, we're trying to balance, we're trying to balance our educational expenses versus the town expenses. So our town, the town size keep doing a lot more with a lot less. Mm -hmm. And it's easier, not easy, it's easier to get money for school because they have people that are always fighting for them. They have school committees, they have, they, and, and they have professional people that can show justification. Most of our time, our town staff are so busy working, they don't have the opportunity to sit down and tell people that they're busy. So, I, I, you brought up to the town staff also. Um, one of the burdens that having such a large percentage of the, of the money going to the schools put on us is, as a town, we're not able to increase staff here. And we have a building staffed by half the people that should have been staffed. When someone goes on vacation, nobody's there to cover it. Um, and that really, you know, a town like Boston, they're having conversations about what do we do with these extra $10 million in terms of beautification and investments and things. And we're over here squibbling over whether or not we can have level services or make cuts. And it's a, it's a real, it's a it, yeah. Um, and how do I put this? I think that there uh, there'd be real value in there being a Boston can apply for large grants because they have grant writers on staff. Lots of grant writers on staff. Probably a whole team of grant writers on staff whose full-time job is to do nothing but that. And that half a million dollars or whatever they spend on those grant writers returns five million dollars to the, to the, the, you know, to Boston. 
and there's a huge return on investment there. Um, if the state offered, especially to rural communities, help with writing, doing grant writing, either with a um, a grant of its own to, in order to get a grant writer, or even a office of, of grant support or something like that, where you know we get an email from them saying, "Hey, we just came across our desk a new grant. It's got you know your name written all over it. You know, we'd be happy to sit down with you and help you fill out the application for it." Um, there is definitely money out there for towns of our size, but not having the staff to be able to find them and apply for them and get them puts us at a real disadvantage to the larger towns, uh, and not just Boston, but Pittsburgh, you know, Worcester. Um, so that kind of thing would definitely be helpful for us. Yeah. Plus, if you could, um, one, one of the things that, that I see us out in our neck of the woods is being able to, to um, staff positions that are necessary are, is becoming harder and harder yeah. um, to, and to find in, in to find people that mo most of the time we are bringing people in for positions they learn the position and then they leave um, to get better paid or to go elsewhere better pay I I think one one problem that we have is that Franklin and and we do have a decreasing po um, population is that we always sell ourselves short <coughs> by telling people how cheap the labor is out here I think that needs to change I, I think we you know we should look at we should look at educational teachers staff whatever we should we should pay comparable to the state um, so there there would have to be there ha there has to be some additional funding that would come out when when you're a young person we may have a great place to live um, but if a person can go and make a hundred thousand dollars 75 miles east where and you're gonna make fifty thousand dollars here where are you going to work you're gonna work here because you get a great quality of life yeah. <laughs> we made those choices but um, if you're if you're young um, it you're gonna probably go where they're, they're paying more money so, so sometime we have so I, I think we should stop we should stop telling us that telling people that we have cheap labor out here because then we don't pe we don't get people to stay, and and but we have to, we have to counter that somehow. No, well, I don't. We don't have the ocean, but we have we have mountains, we have streams, we have water, we have the beautiful river. Um, so there's a lot of pluses out here. Yeah. So and also just sort of more broadly, um, this isn't specific about Sunderland, but the state in general. Um, the state needs to invest more in training teachers, medical staff accountants there's a bunch of professions where there's not enough people in them and the state needs to make investments today so that 10 years from now people can still get their cars repaired and people can still have electrician come to their house and that kind of thing um, and it really seems like across the board there needs to be better ways of getting the people connected with the training opportunities because uh, it's not like there's a lack of people who want to have good paying jobs there's just not enough training programs and opportunities to get people certified for things um, and we feel out here respectfully, and it ties to what Tom was saying, um, when there's only a thousand of so, some profession across the state, and it pays more the further east you go, we don't end up with a lot of whatever it is you talking about, electricians or whatever, um, out this way, because they know they're in demand and they can make more money out east. Um, we see the same thing with nursing staff and all kinds of things like that. Um, so yeah. Jeffrey, do you have anything to add? Um, thank you for everything you've done. I, I do want to say that if there's anything on the Municipal and Public Building Authority bill, happy to write letters of support. Um, and then the other plug I would make is not making remote or hybrid meetings mandatory. Um, 
we're all for as much public participation as possible, but the training and equipment costs, um, unless there was some money involved, <laughs> would be would be really hard for us. Yeah. So. No, I appreciate that. I, I think you know everything that you're you're saying. First of all, I just want to introduce Corinne Coriat from my office. This is my little Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, you know, what you're saying is certainly um, what I've been talking about in Boston, you know, as you're talking about the demographic shifts that we've been seeing with our population getting older, um, and also with Franklin and Berkshire counties being the only two counties to have lost population in the last census, you know, something's got to change. And that is certainly the case that we were making uh, to then candidate uh, Maura Healy and, and the Lieutenant Governor candidates, including Kim Driscoll. Um, and I think that they, they heard that message. They heard loud and clear that we need somebody thinking full time about all things rural. Um, and that goes to grants, it goes to economic development, it, it just spans the whole gamut. Um, transportation, public health, all of, all of those aspects. Um, and so their creation of a director of rural affairs was a really positive first step you know, that we were talking with them about last fall. Uh, we had a meeting with uh, Kim Driscoll and Maureen Healy's chief of staff a week after they were sworn in to talk about a rural agenda and what that would look like. One of the things was the creation of this position. So I'm really happy that they did take that step. The job description should be out in the next week or so and they're looking to hire that uh, into the Executive Office of Economic Development. So um, the Secretary of Economic Development is from the Berkshires. She gets that if economic development looks very different in rural communities than it does in Boston. So I'm really excited about working with her to develop you know, an economic development plan that actually reflects what our rural communities need so that you know, if we're looking at jobs, if we're looking at expanding businesses, that we have um, an approach that really makes sense for us. Um, so that's the Office of, of Rural Affairs. That was a big first step. Um, in terms of sort of that grant support, I, I hear you. <laughs> I actually, um, you know, we brought the Office of Economic Development, actually Stolba and, and Juan, you know, from the MassWorks program. Uh, when I represented Huntington, we brought them out to Route 66 in Huntington and we talked about just that. And then they did the one-stop grant application so that you could just submit one grant. They helped to identify what the right funding source is so that you don't have people like Jeff you know, sort of looking everywhere to try to find the right fit. Um, I will say that the Senator Cumberford and myself and uh, many members of the delegation have also worked to provide a grant workshop to municipalities. Um, where we get the offices and agencies to um, to do a Zoom, and then we talk about the available sources of funding. It was incredibly um, impactful. Last year, we were able to send a lot more money back to this area, but I've also, it was also very instructive for these agencies and departments to hear from us and say, well, wait a minute. That's never going to work for us. We're never going to be eligible for this grant because of X, Y, or Z, or we're never going to be competitive because of whatever. And, and, and Natalie, one, one second. It, it, it's, it's interesting, but back when it seems like when governors take office, they have sometimes they may not be able to push their agenda through through the legislature. So what they do is they, like in a, back with Salucci was governor, he had EO 418. Well, to get money to comply with e EO 418, your staff needed to do all these steps. To, to Well, if you had a planning department or um, you had extra people hanging around, you could follow all the steps. So there, there's, all, there's always like hooks. And, and so if, if we can eliminate the hooks so that, or we could get people out here to put those classes on versus and, and now online is different but a lot of times when you have to when you have to pre-qualify by taking classes or doing certain things it, it, it eliminates us yeah. we, we cannot do that yeah. yeah and I think you know that that is they certainly heard loud and clear from our communities that you know the grant programs didn't work for us for whatever reason so 
I, they were incredibly impactful not only because we were able to direct more resources back to Western Massachusetts, but also uh, it started a conversation to say, you know, these things work, these things don't. I will say that in Governor Healy's but first budget, she did include money for regional planning agencies to do grant writing for communities. Um, we're in the process of developing our house budget, which will be released next Wednesday, and we'll be taking that up the last week of April. So I don't know if that will be included in the house budget, but it certainly would be helpful for our communities to have somebody at RPAs who are, are working with them to, uh, to write those grants, recognizing that we don't have that grant writing staff that that larger communities do. Um, we've also, in terms of bringing up people, uh, we've heard from communities that finding people to work you know, as town administrators or doing financial accounting for communities is a tough skill for, to find. Um, DLS currently has a pilot <coughs> program around accountants, and we're talking with them about how we might be able to work with community colleges to to really build that pool of you know, next generation municipal workers. So hopefully that will also come to fruition. We also are having our grant workshop in a couple weeks for our yeah. stop on the 21st. Good. We'll send out, we'll send out, an email. and it'll be online in terms of when those grant workshops are being offered. And it's just a smaller setting where you just have the ability to talk with the administrators of those programs uh, about what your needs are and what they can offer you. Um, we talked about uh, the municipal and building, um, public safety building authority. That bill does not, has not yet been scheduled for hearing, but when it is, we'll be calling on everybody to, to testify and support. I will tell you that when we brought the chair of public safety out to, he's from Springfield, we brought him out to Asheville and Conway uh, to look at their public safety complexes, and his mind was just blown because you know, you can't walk in front of a truck in Conway because unless you have the door open because there's not enough space there. You walked into the bathroom, you open up the door and there's a toilet and a sink and then it just opens, there's just no wall. It just opens right up into the, the bays. Um, in Asheville, they just have a bar in the police department to handcuff people to. Like, he, he, he there's just no, you know, concept of, of this. Up in Heath, they don't have any bathroom facilities at all. Um, so there's definitely, we're seeing a definite need. We did change the language based on what we heard from communities last session. Um, because you talked about people not really having, ad some areas not having advocates. <clears throat> a lot of our communities need salt sheds. And the way that it, the wording was language, it was worded last session was municipal office buildings. So we just changed it to municipal buildings. So that if a community needed money <clears throat> for a salt shed, that, that, that this is a grant program that they would be able to access. So hopefully it, it fits a little bit better with all of the needs that our communities here, um, certainly in Western Massachusetts, are seeing. Mm -hmm. And then education. <laughs> I've been living, <laughs> living education. Um, Excuse me, Natalie, is there a chance you could speak a little louder? Yeah, sure. It's really hard to hear you. Yep. Yeah. Um, for rural schools, the rural, is that better? Rural yeah. Schools Commission, sorry, it's, it's hard. Uh, I was the chair of the Rural Schools Commission alongside Senator Adam Hines. We did produce a report on rural schools. Uh, there are 36 recommendations included in that report. We are um, working on the budget to see if we can get an increase in rural school aid and in non-resident pupil transportation. Uh, the governor, to her credit, is the very first governor to ever include an increase to rural school aid of $2 million. So we'll be trying to keep that, if not get it higher. The recommendation in the report was for $60 million. Uh, for non-resident pupil transportation, that has historically been funded at $250,000. The actual cost is something, I think it's 4.3 million is what? That's five point, higher, yeah. Five point, it's 4.3 or $5.3 million. And that is what the governor included in her budget. So we're gonna be fighting to make sure that that is protected, because that actually doesn't only help us, it helps pretty much every community across the Commonwealth. So we're trying to build a coalition to support that, tra that school transportation amount. With school choice, um, you know, the, the charge of the committee was to look at rural schools and schools with low and declining enrollment. 
school choice is an issue across the entire Commonwealth. So we couldn't really dig too deep in it, but we did talk about how this is something that needs to be looked at in depth because uh, it seems pretty clear that school choice is not functioning in the way that it was intended to when it was first created. And so we need to take a, another look at it. And I would argue we need to take another look at Chapter 70 uh, just in, in its entirety. Um, and I would be more than willing to, to do that difficult work. Um, but we will be looking at the budget piece. And then we have just introduced um, an omnibus bill that incorporates as many of those 36 recommendations as we possibly could. Uh, one of them is health care. And because that was uh, flagged as a cost by both uh, by DESE in the original report in 2018, and it was flagged again in the Rural Schools Commission. So we dug pretty deep on that to see what we might be able to do there. And I think there is a long-term solution that we're going to try to see if we can pursue. Um, but that's the health care costs are definitely something that, that was flagged in the report. So. Um, that's another bill that when it has a hearing, we will be reaching out to our communities to ask that you submit testimony or that you sign up to testify virtually. I think it's important to point out that after COVID, we do still have the hybrid option for committees. So if you want to testify, you can sign up to testify virtually still rather than driving into Boston and having to spend your entire day. But, but when you drive into Boston, you're elected state rep will take you to lunch and get you a parking you a spot. That, that's one of the little perks. Well, that's, every time I've testified, they've done that. Yeah, absolutely. If you make the trip into Boston, believe me, if I can, I'll take you out to lunch. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I think that, I mean, education, Mass Highway, I'm happy to reach out to, to Patty Levensworth just to talk about that project and make sure that it's aligned. Um, Choice. Well, I, I think the, the, the biggest thing like with on that project is that we know it may be, they they say the last time we talked on what it was like it was it was on their radar I, I don't quite understand what on the radar means is that mm -hmm. is that like in the final stages of design um, or is it beginning stages is it 10 years 15 years we just want to make sure that we still are, are at the table. Yeah. That, that's all. And I think they've been pretty good. Mm -hmm. But we just want to just keep reiterating that we want to be at the, yeah. we have to be at the table. And, and not that I'd like to want to go back to education expense mm -hmm. again, but that it, it is our most, and, and you talk about revisiting Chapter 70, um, and again, I, I would have to say, Franklin County in particular, there are, except for our school, our school district, Union 38, is decreasing in size. And, but as last, last I knew, if you have five kids or 20 kids in a class, the teacher still gets paid the same. Yep. And so right now he says, well, we'll give you, and I'm saying $30 a student, okay. And, and we try to put circuit breakers or whatever in there, but it's still, it's awful hard to, you know, to have a class size decreasing values. And, and I could go one, one step further. I understand Frontier gets a lot of school choice kids. I don't necessarily think that's good for, for us. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's good for Frontier, but I don't think it's good for our area. That, that, because, 88, 100, whatever, how many kids are, are going for school choice, those are kids not going to their home district schools. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's a problem. Yeah. I think that there's another element to what Tom's talking about, which is affordable housing in Western Mass. Um, and not just like, oh, there's an apartment I can rent, but if you're talking about declining enrollment in schools, you have to talk about decline in starter houses. Yeah. Houses that are affordable to purchase for a young couple with a kid or a couple kids. Um, you know, they're moving out of the apartment complexes that are in Sunderland to other towns that have that kind of housing available. Um, and, and combine that with all of the, 
venture capital firms buying up housing across the United States, and especially in Western Massachusetts, there's a whole lot of housing that has turned into all of a sudden it's owned by some corporation out in California. Um, we're seeing a rise in the housing costs, a rise in the housing values, and we're really just pricing out that entire segment of population. Um, people with two young kids do not have the extra income to be able to buy a $400,000 house in one of our towns anymore. Um, and so they're going elsewhere, and with them are going those students, and you know, there's where the economy enrollment comes from. Um, and on that same note, or on a slightly different note, um, the inflation that's happening right now is a real problem for our town and for towns like ours. Um, we were quoted $250,000 for the new ambulance that the South County needs, and it's $375,000 now, and two years later. Um, two and a half percent for Prop two and a half does not cover that. But Boston has new growth, a new skyscraper goes up, that's another million dollars in tax revenue. There's not a lot of empty land in Sunderland. There's not a lot of places for people to build new houses. People are not developing a lot in here. Um, we're very lucky that we ended up having a couple of larger developments with the North 116 Flats and with the Sanderson Place, but we can't count on that happening again anytime soon. And so we're looking at an increase. I mean, pick any one of the, the budget items this year and the 2.5% covers either the elementary school or Frontier or the highway department <laughs> or the increase in the cost for the insurance. Um, which brings us to collective bargaining. Uh, we need more collective bargaining. If we're going to buy an ambulance, we shouldn't be as a town or even as a South County district trying to find and pay for and buy, buy that ambulance by ourselves. There should be a state program that makes relationships with, with whatever company, um, John Deere or whatever, and buys 100,000 of these units over the next 10 years, and then makes available to the towns in the Commonwealth to be able to collectively bargain on those. Um, and not just 10 years ago, it, it, was, it was a money issue. Now it's, it's also an availability issue. Um, we're finding a lot of times the items we need, we're being told two years, five years, maybe we'll have one next year. Oh, sorry, we've, all the ones that we had are already spoken for. Yes. Um, and so that's a real problem for us <coughs> because we, we're, we're currently dealing with not being able to find the loader we need for the, is it the loader, the loader for the highway department. Um, no, it was a uh, one ton. One ton. Okay, there a truck that we're going to end up overpaying for because we're buying one of them as a town, and if we're lucky, we're going to get it in two or three years. Yeah. And so if there was a some kind of collective bargaining in the state for that, um, I mean Boston already does that because they're large. We try to do that with local towns. We try to enter into little cabals with other towns around here. Um, but on the grand scheme, we just can't compete, um, which also touches on health care also. Um, you know, we're a small town. We have a small negotiating group for getting health care, even when we you know, deal with slightly larger things. Um, if the state was negotiating for health care for all municipal employees across the state, we would see better rates with the insurance companies. Um, we'd spend less of the, the, the town's time and effort in researching that and figuring that out and going back and forth with insurance companies. Um, there might even be some way to tie that into you know, mass health and the you know, Massachusetts commitment to having everybody be, have health care. Um, the fact that we're having to negotiate independently for our 70-something employees um, really just seems like it's backwards for that. So. That was actually one of the recommendations, when we talked about rural schools, that was one of the recommendations, was some sort of independent authority, person, agency that would help communities to uh, evaluate insurance options uh, so that somebody else was doing that and that you weren't left you know, having to do all of that work yourself. So that is one of the health care recommendations that was included in the report that would not only help rural schools, but also help communities as well. So that, that is definitely something that, and I think that's, it is going to be a longer term solution because um, unless we do it as a pilot with only a couple of different communities, you know, we really have to be looking at doing that you know, statewide um, for exactly all, for the, all the reasons you just mentioned. Um, and one last thing, and that is that there are often initiatives that come out of Boston or even local initiatives that do good for nonprofits, let's say, like exempting nonprofits from taxes or providing support for them. Um, and sometimes the person, the entity left holding the bill on that 
is a local town because they were able to collect money on that before and not able to anymore. Um, I just like to encourage Boston to consider when they do something like that, look at the impact on what that means for local towns' budgets and plan accordingly money-wise. If that's going to be an impact on a local town, provide money for that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, we've been, um, one of the battles I've been waging since I was first elected was on um, state of land payment in little taxes. Yep. Um, you know, there was a $45 million, no, a $15 million gap there for what that program should have been funded at. Um, and we actually, as a result of our efforts over the last two budget cycles, we closed that $15 million gap. Um, because uh, property values have increased so substantially uh, in recent years, there, there remains another $5 million gap. So we're trying to close that gap this session. Uh, but there's also a formula change that needs to happen with programs like that because it currently disproportionately disadvantages rural communities. So one of the bills that I introduced does aim to change the formula. It's um, what Auditor Bump proposed in her report. Um, so it'd be great if we could think about it in the beginning. Uh, I'm hopeful that this Director of Rural Affairs will be doing just that, looking at legislation saying, actually, this is not going to work for rural communities. We need to be thinking about this differently so that we don't end up in a situation where we have to come back and fix it later on. So, so Natalie, when when I do when I look at the ideal gas law, or all right, when I use different gases, I apply different constants to coming up with an answer. Why is the entire why is the entire state used for a constant of one? Why isn't it if you're if you're a rural community community you you all have the same formula? But you put in a you put in a I'm saying a concept, but you put in a a, a, a number that a multiplier or whatever that you differentiate there because there are differences yeah. and 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 I think that that always hurts us because we always we always use the same formula for everything mm -hmm. and and because we try always to be equal, but we end up not being fair. Right. So so we need to. We need to adjust how we write a formula so and to figure well the formula can't be 100 percent equal but to make it fair we have different yeah. there's a value that we can put in there yeah well look at chapter 90 for example you know, yeah that formula does not help rural communities at no. all uh so one of the winter roads assistance program though does because that is based on roadway mileage and we have a lot of roadway miles so you, know, you should have gotten a check uh, maybe in October of last year for the Winter Roads Assistance Program, and you can spend that money on pretty much anything. Right. Um, recognizing that there doesn't appear to be an appetite to change the Chapter 90 formula, I introduced a law, a, a bill to codify the Winter Roads Assistance Program into a local roads assistance program so that that if we have that chapter 90 formula as it currently exists, and then we have the local roads assistance program that would be based on mileage that would really be sending dollars directly to communities. You know, the, the other, there are several municipal and public safety building authority bills. There's something like eight or nine of them that have been introduced. None of those bills had carve outs for rural communities. And so, you know, that was, critically important to Senator Comerford and I when we introduced that bill is to say, if we're going to introduce this program, a certain amount of money has to be set aside for our rural communities because you know they're just never going to be able to compete with a community that has X number of thousands of people and you know, a, a larger tax base. So we want to make sure that there is a carve out there that right from the beginning. Um, so I think that, you know, I agree with you 100%. And to the extent that I'm able to make those changes, I'm doing it for anything that I'm introducing. I'm making sure that there is a, a consideration for rural communities. Um, and from what I understand, the new director of rural affairs will be going through those grant programs to see what can be changed to better support rural communities too. I think a big part of that is that almost all of the measurements that the state uses is based on population, how many people. 
Um, and it really needs to look at population and land size because it takes X amount of money per square mile to, to support the property, whether you have one person living there or 100,000 people living there. It doesn't make a huge difference. It's like um, capacity to pay, yes. right? <laughs> but it's also, but also in terms of um, green initiatives, carbon taxes, things like that. Because when you look at Boston, you look at how much carbon they're producing. And you look at Sunderland, look at how much carbon they're producing, but you don't look at how many trees Sunderland has or how many trees Boston has. And Western Mass is the lungs of the state, and we're what's keeping the state from being an absolute, you know, carbon hog. Um, and that's, we don't see that in terms of dollars. And it costs money to keep forests going. It costs money to, to have, you know, people, police officers patrolling the, the, local, the rural roads around them. Um, you know, it, it costs the, the, the town money, and it's also it's land that we're preserving that we could, we could develop on if we wanted to. If we wanted to put a whole bunch of new houses, sure, we could start developing these lands, but the state in general appreciates having green parts of the state, and in terms of carbon neutral, in terms of green energy, um, we're doing a heck of a lot better than they are just because we got trees outside. Um, and when it comes down to those initiatives, I really would hope that that is taken into consideration yeah. also. Uh, it's definitely something that the administration has been hearing from us um, because, as you said, we are breathing for the Commonwealth. The Quabbin is providing the water for the entire Boston region, and we get no benefit. There's actually a bill right now to address that from Rep. Saunders and Senator Comerford. Um, so I, I think that there is a growing awareness that we are providing that resource to the entire Commonwealth, and that that needs to be recognized in some way because. Our towns are struggling financially. There is no large business that's going to come in and locate here and increase our tax base. It's all it's going to be borne by the homeowners, and there's only so much that they can pay. That's just the bottom line. So you know, if we're not going to be supporting communities in that way um, with with some additional funding, we want to make sure we just want to be looking at all of those pieces to see how we can be supporting communities. Wonderful. Thank you. So I know I know the uh, you 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 filled very big shoes. Um, <coughs> the being a state rep is not an easy job, especially from when you're this area, um, because you're when you caucus with your group, it's less than the city of Boston. So all of Western Mass doesn't e equal the city of Boston. So sure. so you have I, I I've been very impressed that how you have been able to, to, to go in and work together as the, and, and actually deliver much better than your size would predict that you, <laughs> you should say. Because you guys, it is a very difficult job. I mean, we and, don't have a choice. I mean, we really do have to. Well, you do have, have a choice. Well. You, you don't have to work yeah. as hard. You can just collect your salary. <laughs> Um, but you, you guys do exceptionally, you, your, your group worked exceptionally well together. You're very, you're passing information along to us all the time, which is, and you let us know when there's things that we need to know, because that could very get, easily get past us very quickly. Um, but you're, you're getting that information to us, and you're, rep you're representing us very well. So I, I'd like to thank you because uh, your job is not easy. You spend a lot of time in the car, a lot of time on the phone. Um, and not only that, but you, you still have to put the time in Boston to make the connections to make it right. So I just want to say we, we appreciate what you guys do. Thank you very much. I appreciate, I appreciate all of you. I, and certainly appreciate your partnership. And our job is easy. <laughs> well, especially, <laughs> well, well it is, because you, especially certain, certain <laughs> residents move out of town and things become real easy, you know? <laughs> and never, never. I know. Again. You're leaving us, Tom? <laughs> what, what? <laughs> Although, although I hear from Deerfield the best view, that the best part of living in Deerfield is the view of Sunday. That's what I hear. So. Right on. See, that's what I think. So, well, um, thank you for making time for me tonight. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. you. You all know. I think you all have my number. So call or text yeah, or email we, whenever you need anything. We know your number. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much for coming. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Jeffrey, what do you want to do next? You want to talk about budgets? Sure. Uh, let's talk about, what do you want to tell us? So uh, since last week, we have had our free cash certified. 
Um, about $770,000 in free cash uh, available till June 30th. Um, so I've updated the budget spreadsheet. Um, have not included any free cash. You want to put it, you, all right, so you didn't, you didn't put anything, the use of free cash yet? I have not added the use of free cash in. Um, I added some additional expenses. Um, uh, um, an increase to my salary, a more realistic accounting figure, I think. Um, an updated number for out of school tuition. Um, so, so in what what do you what do you have in here for for health? For health, I have uh, five hundred five hundred and eighty five thousand, which is so typically we carry. However many subscribers we have, plus two family plans of the most uh, expensive plan. So uh, you're, you're looking at 65%, right? 60? What percentage? Th this would be 65% um, for uh, the HMO, the PPO, and 70% for the HMO Select with four additional family PPO plans. Okay. Um, and then there were also uh, two additional positions. Um, one was a part-time uh, resource administrator for the town office building, and the other is a maintenance and grounds uh, employee in the highway department. Full-time, part-time? Full time. And what's the other position <coughs> in the town? Uh, it's a 15 hour a week um, resource administrator. So you talked about how, or maybe Nathaniel did when, when somebody's out, there's no, no backup for them. Right. Um, so, so this person- General would, office support. Time. General office support, you know, elections, they would help the town clerk, tax collection season. They are, you, are, you, are, you talk, are you thinking that this person would also do payroll? This person could do payroll. Um, it, we have somebody who does payroll now, um, a couple hours a week. The person was not interested in increasing their hours from what I'm, I've heard, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was not the impetus um, behind this position, but they could. Well, I'm just thinking that, so this, this position basically could fill in in most locations? Yeah. Temporarily? It, or right, to, help to pick out up your phone and say, during, during I'll the take time. a message. So, yeah. We're doing elections. We need extra help in the town clerk's office. Yep. Heaven forbid I be not the one person who is saying that we should <coughs> tell the town clerk to accept any help. But that being said, could that person also help out with the town clerks? Absolutely. If, if the town clerk wanted the help. Yep. Okay. Yep. It, um... Well. Right. Yeah. yeah. The treasurer collector, you know, she could be on her computer and this person could be at the desk, co you know, collecting the checks so that she could continue working, those types of things. Um, and you're looking for 15 hours a week? Yes. We could do 16. That would be four hours a day, Monday through Thursday. Um, but we could figure out. Did, did you did you write up a uh, job description for, or do you have a job description for yes. the uh, both yeah. positions? Yes, uh, not a formal job description for the um, for the buildings and grounds, but um, also the building ground person also working at the uh, elementary school. If we had the equipment to do the grass, uh, um, no, 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 I'm not looking for the. We have a contract for that, right? Yep. I'm I'm looking at. The custodial are not necessarily building maintainers. And when my conversation with Bill is that 
they they could definitely use a person that could do some maintenance work. That hasn't been brought to my attention. I'm happy to have a conversation with the school if that's the case, and maybe we can share a position. Um, but that I haven't. Have been you asked heard about that? that? Have, okay. So, because like there there's things there's little things that need to be done on a regular occurrence. In in all of the buildings, absolutely. On all the buildings. Yep. And so I would. If, if you entertain bringing this on, I would definitely say it needs to work at the school. It's one of our biggest buildings, right? I mean, that's, that's our responsibility. I'd be more than happy to talk with Bill about that. Or Yeah, yeah, I can reach out. I, I, think, I think he could probably give you a list of things that need to be done. Okay. Building grounds, right? And you also would use um, that person for work plowing snow in the wintertime? Uh, if they have their CDL, yeah, I think that they would help. Okay. Do we need a job description? So you're looking like at changing filters, that type of work, or? I think it would be more the doors off the hinges, the, um, I mean, I guess changing filters. Uh, I don't. A simple I leaking really faucet. Mean, it's yeah, more a of little. Stuff like that. Paint refresh, something. It's kind of like a building and, manager at an apartment complex. You know, come over and fix your shower and <laughs> yeah, put the new air. You know, air the air light out room. front the, with the solar that goes on the the light. Uh, the five pole is out. The, um, look at repairing that. Okay. Can can you can you have a potential job description? Yeah. But it would. I would say. For me, I'd like to see that the school's involved also. So if you need to talk to the facilities, you know, Bill over at the, ask him what he thinks, okay? Give him a call. Okay. And, and George would be in charge of this person? Yes. I'd see if, if you can get George and Bill on the same telephone call, okay? Yep. See if it would work and how you'd allocate. I'm not, I'm not looking at mowing lawn because I mean, we have the contracts. That contract seemed to work very well for us. Were you, were you thinking of doing grass also? Um, in the summers, if that person has time, then we could. I mean, this this is the third year of the contract, so we would have to get another contract anyway. Mm. So it's just, it, it could be. It could be part of that. It might make part sense to see how course. much demand we have for their hours without the grass and if we have if that extra time great if not then right but then you know. too once you start with mowing that's equipment purchases yeah, yeah. i don't know you maintain, know maintain maintain the it's a full basically ends up being right you know time. that you need trailers you need a truck to move it, it but if mowing looking, grass isn't oh yes so you're looking like for going out in your backyard here would also be using for maintaining the parks? The that would be the hope that they would clean the bathrooms now that they're getting refinished. I saw them out there. Um, you know, maybe we can put some trash cans back out there and they get to clean them out once a week. That Those were all activities that you're hoping this person would be able to do. Okay. Can we, have, can we get a job description there? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, what else you got? Um, well, we have a $260,000 um, budget gap that we got to close. So a couple of good good news items on that. Um, the first one is uh, I got word that there's a $30,000 grant that we've secured that can be used for um, behavioral health workforce, which will help offset the cost of the new position the school's asking for. 
Um, in addition to this, I talked to Jeff earlier about um, currently the Sanderson Place is not included in our new growth numbers. Um, and so that will change things a little bit on that end. And those two items are certainly aren't going to close the gap, but they will make the gap a little bit easier to bridge. Um, and obviously having almost $800,000 in free cash does give us more flexibility than it would in a non-free cash heavy year. Is that an uh, annual grant? Do not know that yet. So, so under the accountant, what do you have for the accountant right now? I, I see you got eighty thousand. Uh, eighty thousand, and then twenty-five thousand um, for expenses. And how do you get those numbers? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, I know. I, I think we're either going to wind up with a a company, um, and we're going to have to either buy a software license and transfer all our data over to a new uh, software, because my understanding is that the software we currently use is not the standard, um, or we're going to have to hire somebody and. If we're going to hire a good accountant, I, people said that I should expect to pay six figures. So either way. Um, All right. Um, so 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 moving forward on the account, what's what's our plan for the remainder of the year? So right now, I'm not sure where the FERCOG stands. So I'm going to be um, reaching out and looking at other accounting firms and and talking to them and seeing as how quickly they can start. Because uh, as of Wednesday, uh, the accountant is gone. Okay. So the twenty-five for the expense. Your. The first year would probably be the biggest expense right. on that because it would involve transferring the data. Yep. And then after that, it would pro again, can't say for sure, but probably fall more in line with what we've been paying for software. Right. Um, the. It was indicated to me that it would be about, they thought about $8,000 in an annual cost and 5000 to transfer. That seems really low to me. Yeah, considering um, where. So I just, I just don't believe that. <laughs> and I'd rather have. Oh, yeah, a question there because you don't want to find out that it's. I mean, that was cheaper than just the expense of the software we were using. All right. So you're you're working you're gonna work with the uh, you're gonna work with the FERCOG to see. So basically, you're gonna tell them that July first we're going out on our own. Yep. Right. Yep. So you need to figure out what we're doing from now to June thirtieth. Right. And after, yeah. Yeah. So you're gonna put out you're gonna put out a uh, RFP. Yep. I, that, I that's for sorry that's for fiscal year twenty four because we might yeah. have to do an emergency thing earlier. But yeah. Well, you know, we, we don't. So, all right. So you're you're just so everyone knows. So you're gonna. You're going to talk to the FERCOG between now and I would talk they would already come back with a plan, but they don't have a plan yet. So you're going to give them to give them a couple more days, right? Yep. And if they don't have a plan, you're going to you're going to have. I'll have our plan be ready to go. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. That's all you can do. Okay. Okay. And then. Plan C is for next year. Yep. Okay. All right. What else you got? Uh, the warrant. Um, it was only one new thing. Um, well, the article numbers changed, but. So 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 when you go through and look at the tax tax the uh, the tax collector. Uh, treasurer, you got an increase of 13% on the payroll clerk position. 
right? Yes. And that's the same person working the same amount of hours? Or are you increasing the hours? Um, I believe it's the same person working the same amount of hours. Yeah. Okay. The only change in the town clerk is salary. Um, yes. No change in committees and boards. Town building, you, you also have a potential change here, right? On, on town building. Um, we are increase. Uh, I mean, we're increasing expense costs and energy. Was there something else? Um, you're going. The you got your increase in your public public safety complex. You went up six thousand dollars. Yep. That's is that energy. It's energy and just the cost of supplies going up, and they have not. Um, All right, so public safety complex energy, they're holding that at 15.2, 15.3, and then public safety complex operation, you're going from 11.7 to 17.7? Yes. Yep. And why are they doing that? Um, they have deferred maintenance that they would like to take care of. Okay, can we review that? Sure. Okay. Police department looks like uh, pretty consistent. Right? No big changes? Nope. The only big thing is the police clerk wages? Yeah, uh, it's an increase of four hours a week. Increased by four hours? Mm-hmm. Okay. The in ex town inspections? A, a new position for a permit coordinator. Okay. Is that going to be a posted job? Yep. Okay. So, the permit court, just questioning, how many hours a week was that? Was it just a couple a week? Yeah, I think it was. I think four five. or five, yeah. right? <coughs> well, does it make sense to put that permit coordinator in with the general office help? So, you know, I'm just... Yeah. And then you can always, next year, if that general office help, this is all too much for that person... Yep. Then you can look at. It. No. Then if, I mean I don't know. I'm just asking if that is like a. If we're gonna have someone in here doing general work, when the inspectors come in and out of the building, you know that person would likely be here. Yeah, and it would be a great. Um, you know, I know people. The inspectors don't have office hours, so it might be nice just to have somebody to say, "Hey, yeah, I'll take." I'll have them get in touch with you. Yeah. Looks like the building inspector expense is also going up by a pretty sizable amount. Do they have any justification for that or just in the same deal where everything's more expensive? Was it books, code books or something? Yeah, it, it was... I think they needed... There was code books. Um, every few years. Yeah, the code cycle, yeah. yeah. Uh, they go I, I, off the top of my head. Um, if, if you want, I can run down and... Yeah, but I do think there were uh, almost half of that was just the code books. 
Yeah. Okay. It's just it's a sizable percentage increase for the total town inspectors from 38 to 51, 26 percent. You know? Yeah, I think the books are like 1,500 bucks or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, li I like Crystal's idea of having the permit coordinator be tied into that other role. It'll make both make it easier to find somebody for more hours than trying to find somebody for just a couple hours a week. Um. So, Jeff, can, on the on the code book for the building and can building commissioner, can you just ensure that the code books are maintained in the uh, town sundown? Yep. As well, can I? I know he has to have them just. Should that they should be here in the town? What's the civil defense line item? Um, sorry, I th he might he may have online access to the code books. I'll double check that. It is. So. You do. Okay, but you also have right physical there. and the okay, physical should be here, right? Right, yeah. Is that what you're saying? It, I. It looks like he wants to buy. He wants to buy yeah. the books. Okay. So. If, he, if he's going to buy the book, it's fine. You can, I, I like because so I like to be kept here. You can see it too, but I didn't even realize you could hover. Okay. No. So when there's those little purple coordinate things. Yeah. Okay. Um, highway department, you have an increase of 17 percent, but most of that is 26 percent increase in fuel. Right. Yep. Okay. Health and sanitation. Board of health expenses. But those are reoccurring anyways, aren't they? Don't they get those from fees? They have a revolving fund. Yeah, they offset those mostly from... Most, the, yeah, most. Okay. Library. 12%. Mm -hmm. Increase of 12% in their support wages. Mm -hmm. What was that? Remember that? Jeff? That was a long time ago. Additional hours, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. Additional hours for the head of adult services, wage increases, um, and 2.5% uh, COLA. Okay. Elementary? Yep. Uh, 6.7% increase. Yeah. You guys want to say anything? Um, it's what we voted. Uh, knowing that the free cash wasn't certified yet and that, that we didn't necessarily have a go-get number uh, from the town saying, you know, this is good or this is how much we're looking uh, to have cut. Uh, so there was a lot of robust discussion uh, that's where it is now. Uh, we, the town now that has a clear picture of what's going on wants to give guidance on. We, we do have, uh, sounds like we're going to schedule another meeting uh, maybe a couple weeks out. We've got one this week that's uh, a whole new 38. But uh, because of this grant that was just discovered uh, and the implications of that, uh, there's going to be time to have another meeting in discussion so uh, that's that's where it's at it includes a new position for the uh, the coordinator to do the multi-tiered system of support as well as the, the social emotional uh, yeah, support um, we're here to listen okay um Can can you explain the new position that's created? I don't I don't fully understand that. I can take a shot. Guess can you maybe take a better shot? Uh, I can try. So this is a a new position. The title is school adjustment counselor. We currently do not have a school adjustment counselor. We have a school psychologist whose job is supposed to be evaluating students, but she also does all of the school adjustment counselor type of roles filling in as needed. Um, the new position would be providing social emotional support to children um, on an as needed basis. It would involve um, social emotional learning instruction, so presenting to students about, you know, I, I mean, I, I work in elementary schools, 
identifying your feelings, managing your feelings, basic things that kids need support to, to grow and do and be ready to learn. Um, and also this person, this is really important, they would be helping with um, an approach called multi-tiered systems of support, which is um, the idea that you try uh, with an entire class of kids, some of them are identified as having disabilities, some of them are not, um, but you try providing a basic level of supports to all kids to help them try to succeed, and kids who are not yet succeeding, you give them a new level of supports. Kids who are not yet succeeding, you give them another level. Um, that includes social-emotional supports. It's not just academic. So in order to really implement this in a meaningful way, um, with fidelity, we need an expert in those matters for supporting those kids. Now, is, is, this, a, is this a position? Greg? Sorry, if I could just piggyback, 100% there, thank you for that. Um, also, the need uh, is certainly, it's something we probably could have used before, but trying to address some of the COVID and getting kids made up from that, uh, you know, pe people missed in classroom instruction, which is obviously more effective. Uh, so there's, it, it is a really good way to address not just crisis stuff, but kids who have in-between needs who maybe have both social and academic, uh, some sort of, whether it's dyslexia or what have you, uh, maybe it's not enough where the kid uh, needs to be part of some sort of larger program, but it's someone who can sort of float between classrooms and uh, you know, create a little bit of a glue and uh, common practices between different classrooms to if I also point out, this isn't just about supporting the students, it's also about supporting the teachers, because the teachers shouldn't have to try to be counselors on top of being teachers, on top of being all the other thousands of hats they wear. Um, and so this is also an investment in our teachers, and as we've been talking about, it's hard to, keep, to get and maintain and keep good staff, and when you provide a, a service like this that then makes their jobs more doable, it helps with retention, it helps with happiness, it helps with all the different you know, s secondary aspects. Um, to all the school members, not just the students. So I think that's a big part of it. Sorry, go ahead. I can piggyback on what Greg was saying about the impact of the pandemic on kids. Last week we had parent-teacher conferences, and I met one very veteran educator who said kids are really different right now than they've ever been before. Um, that kids are further behind academically than they have ever seen in their careers. And the kids who are at grade level on their academics are struggling with things like separation anxiety and bullying, and she says none of these kids are where they would have been five years ago. So it is still pandemic recovery. And we're also talking about the kids who were already a couple years, at least three or four years old when the pandemic hit. In the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing the kids who were infants during the pandemic mm -hmm. and never got that initial socialization with baby groups and that kind of thing and are really behind in that social aspect. I mean, there's, there's, there's high school students who are suffering from that because of the pandemic, but we're going to be seeing kindergarten and preschool classes coming in that are just full of kids who have, some of them have only had minor interaction with other kids at that point, um, where we would see a lot more of that in other non-COVID times. Um, so I, I, mean, I think that the need is here today, the need's gonna be even more so next year and the following year and year after. And we did talk about um, possibly making it a part-time position or maybe even sharing with other towns as a way to defray costs and then the team back and said that the significant part of this job would, would be unscheduled interventions. Yep. And also the difficulty of trying to find somebody who was willing to work with this kind of job as a part-time position um, or somebody who's willing to be an itinerant provider and go to four different schools. Uh, my mom was a special education reading teacher for the Amherst area for like 23 years or something like that. Um, and they couldn't find somebody to replace her who was willing to drive to every single town or every single school. She went to five different schools every single day, multiple times to this school and then back to the same school multiple times. And you just will not find people going forward who are willing to do that kind of thing. Um, so making it a full-time position would also make it easier to find a person. Darius mentioned Darefield had a um, school adjustment counselor position go unfilled all year uh, because it was a one-year posting. So just we're theorizing that the hiring would be better if it's a full-time and renewed position, renewable position. Where's the qualifications for that position? Is it a clinical psychology 
Uh, wouldn't be a clinical psychologist. I'm not positive to be honest, but I think it, I think it might include social workers. Um, I don't. I think there's a DESE certification, like from the State Department of Education, but I'm not positive. We haven't discussed that. Anybody else? Like? I, I helped a lady do uh, her PhD thesis on MTSS. And I don't know a lot, but from working with her a little bit, uh, it sounds like it's sort of a new identified best practice. But I don't think it's, and many people who uh, advocate for it or participate are school psychologists. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to also bridge a little bit into some academic stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, sort of finding the, uh, yeah. the, the, sort of the in between, mm -hmm. okay, this person needs a little bit of this, this person needs a little bit of that. That's the multiple tiers are mm -hmm. this person needs one type of intervention, uh, a smaller cohort might need a, more significant intervention, and a few students might need something really to reach in a lot. So, so our what we got to try to do is we got to come up while you have while we have this year free cash that could solve the problem. We have to kind of look at a budget to figure that we have to make. These are re so that position would be a reoccurring expense. So we have to try to find reoccurring revenue. So free cash is not necessarily what we would consider reoccurring revenue. So we have to try to find we have to balance that. That has to be our balance. And Jeffrey, how how much are we spending more this year with the uh, going to sixty five? That about you said forty thousand. Uh, yeah, yep. Um, I think it's. And, and how much in the budget was the uh, position? Uh, Sixty. So it, it's if we have the same number of subs. So. <laughs> yeah, I I know. I, it's yeah. Yeah, but but don't we don't have to we don't have to go that much in the weeds. I just. We all understand it's going to cost more if more people take the, that. That's a given. But I think as it Crystal stands was right now, be asking why this number is more than forty thousand more than last year's number. Is that why you're saying? giving me a look? No. Oh, okay. Well, she, no. We understand. We, she understands okay. because it, it, we have to. We have to throw more money in there just in case. Yeah, that that's understood. So we have we have to so 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 those two things right there are a hundred thousand. So you understand what we're trying to do? Yeah. Does anybody have any words of wisdom? Peter, you been awful quiet tonight. Words of wisdom? We're going to get some decisions to make. You know, it's part of the, we're going to get late in the game. But um, I think one thing, obviously, if I get free cash or a bond, there's, you know, a week ago I would have said very likely we might be putting off town meeting. I don't see that any reason that needs to happen. But what that does mean is that, you know, you've got a number of things you've added to the budget here. Um, part of going back to the, you know, early in the budget season, I think you requested people to put in stuff that was asking yep. for more, mm -hmm. uh, that would provide more services, um, give them opportunity to speak up and Show that well. I think you're at the point of, of uh, one way or another figuring out how to pick and choose. And um, you know, usually at this point, you nothing's on the list that isn't needed. And I, I don't think you're going to come up and say, "Well, we really, you know, that's a lousy idea," or something like that. And so the problem still is. So, you know, so why, much, why wouldn't you, how much can you feel like you could afford if it's going to be for stuff that pretty much all these things are ongoing expenses? Pretty much everything I've seen here that's been added is coming back the following year. Well, it is, you know, I mean, we've got several places where you're, you know, adding anything, you know, and just on the town side, there's one full time position, there are, there are various lesser positions that are being added or hours expanded, or stuff like that. You know that's that's coming back to get you the next year too. So, um, you know, I don't know. At a certain point, you just got to well, okay, we got to how much we want to bite off, and um, you know, I mean, I, 
could sit here and say, you know, if I was wanting to make, you know, uh, my own judgment on all that, it would probably be. I mean, what's the number there? Two sixty right now. Yeah. Two sixty seems awful rich to be going for a cash out. Okay. On the other hand, if you look back, if I look back in previous years, last few years. See, I can under, I can understand one hundred fifty two hundred thousand off free cash. Yeah, that's that's what I'm looking. I'm looking that, here. that that's kind of a re that's kind of a reoccurring what what we see being applied. Actually, if I look back over the last from eighteen up to twenty three, we used anything from basically we had four years that were about in the one twenty to one sixty range, and we had two years that were in the. 240 to 260 range. Um, yeah. I would be happier just speaking as a, you know, I'm always one for having a less your money in the bank rather than spending everything you've got, and I would be happier with, it's just me. No, I. Be an individual, not a school committee member, okay? You know, if we were using 200, I would say, yeah, that's, you know, that doesn't seem See, unreasonable. That, if you get too much above that, now it's sort of like, well, you know, next year maybe or maybe it's going to be a couple years before things tighten up a lot or something, but, um, you know, you're not that far off. I don't know if, uh, I don't think really much has been looked at in the way of local receipts as to whether that's a place where, where more money is going to come in. I mean, the one thing I would say with local receipts is, and again, I don't, I mean, we don't have a, we basically don't have an accountant, so I can't go ask this question, is, or maybe the treasurer would know. Are, if, we getting, are we getting, you if know, I years was, we could get no interest on our bank balances, you know, or we could, we could be getting, you know, three, four percent on a bunch of money that we got invested in, that would be something that you could say, yeah, that's going to be coming in, and so that's something you can, at least for the near future, you can count on, but. I, I know we, we, our receipts were probably, we budgeted, what, 410 last year, 420, something like that? Seven. Ten, seven, yeah. seven ten, and we, yeah. and we brought in seven, eight. Yeah. Right. So we had about so the difference, you know, was so we budgeted seven ten. We brought in seven eight. Yeah, but but that that that's not a lot. That's I mean that's kind of normal. Um, and we budgeted high. We budgeted high. We budgeted higher last year. Seven eighty, not seven eight. Right. We got. We took in more than we budgeted. Yes. Yeah, seven right. seven hundred eighty thousand yeah, right. versus seven. I. I just wanted I, to make I, sure I was. I mean, you exponential three, Jeff. Okay, seven ten exponential three. Um, I, we are taking in more than seven hundred and ten dollars. Yeah. So. But I don't, I'm just again. I'm talking. I'm, I'm talking not a school committee member. I'm just talking. I know. I know. I just, this is just a conversation. I'm always a little cautious, but on the other hand. Well, see, I have a different. I have a, see. I have a different idea of what what. I think we all. I think we all serve on any committee in town and, and we have multiple masters per se because I, I think you you can be you can you can be on the school committee and only think about the the school yet the school is a big part of the town and I've always thought it been so you always have to so you have to think more you guys have to, the, I, I would think the school committee has to ask the hard questions to the administrators because the administrator, and, and we all have to do that. that that's, that's what we do. I, and, and we all question one another and it's not, if, it's not just like the library and, and no, no one advocates for the police, no one advocates for the sewer department. <laughs> Although when you see sewer running down the stairs like I did today, you, would advocate for the sewer, but <laughs> uh, I, I just think it, it's it's more complicated than I'm a school committee member or I'm a library trustee, and I think all of you understand that. I, I'm just trying to I'm just and again we can you can still cover it. We didn't we haven't put you're still using the 710 from last year for so we're still using the 710. Can we meet? Can we bump that up forty fifty thousand dollars? Probably, you know, and, and that would that would be consistent with the numbers that we. But 
as we talked earlier today, we have no idea what our accountant is doing right now. So, and more importantly, the accountant doesn't know what they're doing. So, okay. that's me personally speaking. Right. And, and, and one of the things I'll just add, and that is that, um, you know, I've tended on the school committee to steer away from stuff that involves the little ones in the school because not being a parent, I have much less experience than others yeah. do that have had dealt with all the goods and the bad, all the, all the goods and all the problems of, of race and all the different kids we got and so on. But I do listen to the stuff that is being said and I do think about the situation that our society and our town have been under the last three years with COVID and how that has impacted people in different negative ways. And certainly, the, there's been an impact on the little kids who missed out on a whole lot of just what is part of the education you get thrown up through those years. And it just, you know, so that I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for when I hear Jessica and Greg talking about the need for it from much more experience than I would have that, you know, that, that uh, I'm really inclined to say, yeah, that really is something that's true and it really is something that matters, so. Um. Well, I think if, if we're talking about $200,000 being a reasonable number, we're not that far off that number. And if we count in a little bit more from local receipts, the $30,000 for the grant towards the position, Sanderson Place not being counted into the into the calculations, um, we're pretty much at the two hundred thousand dollar mark as it stands. Um, and just for you know bigger picture, the overall budget is going up by nine percent, and the school is only asking for six. And so if if there's you know there's other departments that are asking for much more sizable increases, and much more of that money is coming from other buckets than from the school bucket. Um, and, and, and you know. In all honesty, the fact that our entire town has managed to keep to 9% when inflation is that much, um, and that's not even on top of other drivers, um, I think it's pretty impressive to be with. So, so when, when, a, when a new position is presented, so I, I, I know we've been, t so I, I, I look at 24 years here and we still have this, actually we got less people today in town office than we did 24 years ago. And I, it scares, it scares me because we were talking before, if someone's out, we have no one to answer the telephone, right? And so we used to we used to have we used to have a maintenance guy Greg and we lay not this Greg but another Greg and we had to lay him off back when the override didn't pass the first time and I think that I I don't, at that time I don't think we understood the needs at the elementary school because I think there's great needs at the elementary school to have someone to because there's so many people so many young children so many people going in and out of that building every day there's a there's a huge day-to-day -day maintenance need that's not and I'm not just talking cleaning I'm just talking we we had fascia that was down for what two years because we couldn't get anybody to put up fascia it's like geez now what that that causes having the fascia down causes so much more problems with moisture getting in and and, and causing rot and stuff so we're not doing that preventative type maintenance and and so do you ask the do you ask the uh custodial staff the building maintainers to, to go in and, and blow down the boilers. Who who blow, who blows down the boilers? You know, to make sure that you're you're taking and you know blowing out the sight glasses. Um, I I just think there's 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 needs that we're not meeting there. So I, I look at in, when we first talked and when we first talked about that 
the building and grounds position, you know, when I, when I talked to Bill, because I, we t Bill asked me questions about the asbestos in the building, which there is no asbestos in the building, but we still get ding dinged for the asbestos. Um, and some of the things, just that Scott and I knew so much about that building from the reconstruction. So I did talk to Bill a lot. And, it's, and some of the things that don't get done, and I understand why they don't get done, because there's no one, they're assigned to do them. And so things may get done, but there's always, you know, when Bill and I were trying to find drain pipe, you know, Bill was trying to find drain pipes and because we're getting water and everything, and we're down there, Bill has to, Bill's the one digging the trap rock off because we don't have anybody there to do it besides him. So, and, and, and Ben doesn't work well with a shovel, so that was a joke. Um, because he's busy doing, he's doing principal stuff, right? So, I mean, you can't expect your principal to be out digging a hole. Although they used to, Mr. A did, but. So, I, you know, I, I can look at these positions and justify, and, and when I look at the recommendation from the insurance group that we had, I think they're insurant, they're, the insurance group made a heck of a heck of a recommendation because I I think we've been trying to do that now for four or five years so that that's a well needed thing but how do you how do you add all right now you have a new a new position and so you have a new position sixty you're looking for what sixty thousand and we know that indirects are probably around thirty eight percent are the indirects that you that you never see in your so that if you say thirty eight there's almost a ninety thousand dollar, eighty thousand dollar position. So we have to just have to start thinking about that. But when but when we at but when we add a position, we've been talking about this for another. How how does that go into schools? Have you been talking about this other position for a while, or is this something that was new that just came up? We've had this out of last year's budget. We needed this. Again. Yeah. I mean, I can say that when my kids were at the elementary school, this position would have been incredibly helpful for them. Um, and I think that your point about the, the, the deferred maintenance and this sort of middle ground is really important because um, there are kids who don't necessarily need to be on a 504 or an IEP, but need more support than they're getting. And currently, either they're being forced onto a 504 or an IEP to get the services they need, or they're not getting the services they need. Neither of those scenarios are great. This is a position that will allow both to prevent some students need, needing to go on to the more expensive IEP 504 kind of path, um, as well as servicing the kids who are falling through the cracks because they're not quite bad enough to be able to qualify for the services they would need. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's deferred maintenance on our kids is really what it is. Is you know. We pass it down the road, and then we have kids who end up at the high school who have bigger problems if we don't have the support they need when they need it. Mm. Okay. So what do you want us to tell you tonight? Anything? Um, I think that I will come back. I'll look at maybe using up to 200000 of free cash. Um, try and get some more information on the grant um, and new growth and, and hopefully have a smaller smaller gap or no gap. Then. All right, so look at look at the revenue side, okay? Now when did, did, did Natalie say that, did Natalie say that the uh, house is coming out with a budget this week or next week? She did. She made it sound like there might be more money for us out of that, which would not be a bad thing. I thought she said next Friday. I thought so. I thought she said next Friday, right? right. That's why we should have told her come out budget so in an appropriate manner so we can use them. <laughs> and you push elections back a little bit so the governor has more time, you know. How is it June? <sighs> Wait, well, did did you did you pencil in the uh, South County EMS <laughs> reduction in budget from the town of Deerfield? I haven't even read the email yet. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Okay. I. So you're going to that. That's your task. Yep. All right. Any questions for Jeff? Words of wisdom. We're going to refrain from deliberating anything <laughs> in this forum. Yeah. Like we said, uh, a week from Tuesday, uh, we, we can discuss it appropriately. Uh, what to do about this uh, this grant? Just just so just. I I. I would be hard pressed not to 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 go with the increase in percentage for insurance. That 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 would be a pri one of my priorities. Okay. That I that so whatever that means. That's one thing I think is very important. And and if I if I had to one other thing that I would prioritize is the. Uh, Position where you're going to give town the 15 hours a week, and and just so everyone knows why why we asked to make our life more difficult by asking for all this other stuff was it, it's important that you look at what your departments are telling you, and and to understand because it's it's easy to say okay just spend two and a half percent and justify anything over that or less um, but it's also important to see what 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 we may be missing and that's why we asked that Peter um, I just wanted the other position that of significance is the town voting grounds one and I didn't know if part of the consideration was making that something you know still a bunch, but not full time. Yeah, um, Jeffrey, Fox. I'm just tossing that out because I'm looking in my mind. I'm going through my mind the places, the things that have been added on. And if you look at something, well, there's a there's a police clerk, I believe, that's an extra four yeah. hours a week. Yes. Yeah. You know, I that's that's the yeah, answer. That's that's well needed. You know, yeah. and it's not a, it's not a big ask, and I know people around you don't tend to ask for a long time until they really need something, and I think that's that kind of thing. And uh, I look at you know I look at some other of these of the modest ones in here, and they seem like yeah, okay, that really does make sense. Um, this one I don't know because I don't know. Um, one of the things was the building ground when we first talked about it. We we, we thought a because. The, the deferred everyday maintenance that we're not doing and, and it does catch up on it. but we also felt when our conversation was that that would be a person and that would hopefully you would use that person in the winter time with snow and I I would have thought if we do have another full-time person like that we could reduce our our seasonal and you know position you know the seasonal line item yeah and potentially snow and ice over time too right and it's it's one of those that if that person you bring them in full time and if they're not super busy you start making that okay well can they take on what are janitorial services that we're paying you know a contract but you don't you can't i, I don't know the right way to work day one we don't know how busy that person is and if every minute of their time is going to be taken up. And if you do find that that person doesn't really have enough, you could start looking at what do we want to eliminate and would that be the person who comes through here and cleans? Or would that be, you know, there's things you can start adding into it if that person has excess time. Or do we want to next year talk about lawn maintenance, you know, if he's got one right. hours a week of his time on his hands or something. One of the other areas of increase in the school budget this year is for increased custodial hours over the summer for doing summer work. Is this new position something that can maybe and so, play with that piece of the school budget? Right, so, so that's hard to say because we don't know, right? We don't know if at this point I don't think we can say will they be tied up 
until they're here working, will they be tied up all summer long, dumping trash cans and, you know, cleaning the bathrooms back here? We just, you just don't know this first year, or the first year that they're here, what their time is really going to look like and what things are going to come up, you know. I'm not sure if we have... But, but I'm just tossing this out. Yeah. Let's say, start them at a 30-hour week position. you got an option if it really turns out to be a ton of stuff that, you know, it needs yeah. to be done and they're productive of coming back at a later point and end up in it. But in the meantime, you know, which, yeah, it's just a possibility. And I right. think that, that that kind of position is going to be easier to find someone to do 30 hours than the counselor position because there's a lot more people out there who are, have the skill set and have the ability to do that work and are looking for work and not trying to find a specialized person with some degree. It's someone who can pick a shovel up and has basic understanding of how electricity and Right, because at one time you know? we thought about doing it as a half time and maybe getting some, you know, perfect scenario of somebody who's recently retired and looking to fill 20 hours a week. But then is that a, really the right way to go with it? Yeah, well, I think we really don't know what the effect is going to be on the budget until we've had a year of that person in there. Because um, maybe the school comes back with slightly higher E&D numbers because they didn't use all their custodial money in the summer. And maybe we find that we found some ways to save some other things and maybe all that adds up to his salary or close to it. We don't, we don't really know until we've done a year of it. Or her. Or her, sorry. Or them. We, we had, we had uh, thought right before COVID that we, we were going to try to put a program in the highway in the summer to hire um, disadvantaged youths. Um, f unfortunately, COVID started and it, that's unfortunately fallen through. But you know it, how hard it is to try to find work for young people adults and we figured that would be a great way to do that we figured we could make that that happen but covid kind of kiboshed that so and we haven't got back there yet that that was one of our things that we tried to do um george george and i talked with the board and and we thought that that would have been a good step for us but i still think it's a worthwhile thing to pursue um just just uh, the whole thing about getting up every morning, coming to work, doing a good day's work, you know, following, you know, the orders of your the supervisor. And it's a great kind of, and a lot of those jobs are no, although now there, I guess there's ability to get those jobs where they wasn't a few years ago, but okay. All right, so we got, we got, we got our, uh, we got our marching orders. Thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. All right, Jeffrey, what else you want to talk about? Um, just, uh, I added a couple Warren articles last week. I mentioned that the capital budget, um, because we weren't sure about override. I think we have uh, a the warrants that council recommends, which was a regular capital budget based on available capital stabilization and free cash. Then the question about the override. So are, you're talking about Article 3, right? The budget or Article 4? Article the budget, 4, yeah. The budget article? Yep. Okay. So, so previously I had Article 4 and then the next article was the op opioid settlement. Yeah. And so I added Article 5, which is the override question, and then Article 6, which is a, if the override passes at the polls, these projects would be funded out of capital stabilization. All right, so you're looking for then what? You're looking for, to include Article 3? So, cur yes, currently right, we don't right. have 3, 4, 5, or 6. So Article 3 is the uh, budget yes. article? Yep. Okay. So I'd enter, entertain a motion to include Article A motion article to three. include Article 3. Seconded. A motion made and seconded to include Article 3. It looks like because we're going to have a town meeting this year as scheduled. Okay. All those in favor of inclusion of Article 3 signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Article.
article now you want to talk about article four the capital budget as well jeff yeah we so didn't put this one in yet we did not put capital in no okay um so you happy with the uh the wording yes okay i'll entertain a motion for article four i hang on let me just try to finish again. okay i motion we include article four seconded your motion made and seconded to include Article 4 as presented. All those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes. Aye. Article 5, we needed to do Is this that one. 3 0 on 4? Yeah. yeah. We needed Article 5 as well? Yes. And that's the stabilization. And you got the, the wording that you're uh, okay with? Yep. So you contingent upon passes a prop 2.5? Mm hmm. So what this means is that we would need to come back to a special town meeting if Article Five, if Article Five passes and it doesn't pass, we'd have to come back to a special. No, that's, that's what Article we're doing Six. This. Yeah, that's what we're doing this way. Okay, so Article Five, motion then for Article Five. I motion we include Article Five. Seconded. Motion made and seconded to include Article 5. That will see if the town will vote to raise appropriate any additional amounts of the proposed of funding the town's municipal capital stabilization fund for the fiscal year July 1, 2023, contingent upon passage of Prop 2.5 ballot question under General Laws Chapter 59, 21C, and take any other actions. Okay, so we have a motion made and seconded on 5. All those. In favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And Article 6, inclusion. Yep. Article 6 says, do you have a motion? I motion to include Article 6. Seconded. We have a motion made and seconded on Article 6 to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate transfer from Villa funds or others to provide some of monies of the fiscal year 24 capital budget specifically for the capital equipment building facilities contingent oh as shown on document entitled contingent fy 24 capital budget by funding source okay motion made and seconded on article six all those in favor of inclusion signify by saying aye aye, aye. three zero jeff so that's all the articles. So we're all set? Yep. Yeah. All right, what else do you want to talk about? ARPA. Oh, oil tanks. Oil tanks, yes. What do you got on that? So, um... What did Darius tell us? Darius got another quote that was, I think, like a, a couple thousand dollars less. 27 cents. The quote was... But he said he wanted to stay with Ty and Bond, right? Right. The quote was based off of the work that Ty and Bond did and the other company didn't actually come out to the school. And I don't know if any of the school committee members have anything else to add, but, you know, they said Ty and Bond came out, they looked, they bring multiple people to every meeting, they know us, they've worked with us, um, and we have confidence in them and less confidence in... Uh, the other group. If it was a much bigger difference, I'd say let's you know talk about it. But yeah, if, if that's Darius's suggestion, I would I would go with that also. Twenty-seven seven versus. Time bond proposal seems much better prepared to me. From my look at it. Is it only a thousand? Maybe. Twenty-one hundred difference. Yeah, it's twenty-one hundred. It's not. And there was, I mean, the three points you made were that. First of all, Ty and Bond were the folks that, that, that did the initial study, and so they've already had it on their agenda for, you know, and then know it in detail that um, uh, we have, uh, in the district, we've had occasions where we've worked with Ty and Bond before, and it's always been a positive uh, relationship. Um, and uh, in the, going through this process, as far as getting the engineering stuff, they've been, like, right there and showing up and interested and trying to, you know, go beyond, you know, the minimum in terms of helping us get to a, what we need to do. And so we just said, boy, that's those are three things you do not see in the other bit at all. And 
Sounds like they want our business. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I think it's, you know, he had no, you know, sometimes people give a recommendation, but it's like, yeah, we can go with either one, but I sort of like this one better. In this case, it's like, no, this is the one that, you know, we would much rather go for. All right, so you're looking for a motion to to uh, appropriate the amount to 29.8? Yep. Okay. Do you want to say 30s so there's a little, or no, this is an actual quote, so this is? Yeah. yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, so I motion we appro appropriate from ARPA funds $29,800 for the oil tank engineering. Seconded. Okay, we have a motion made to utilize $29,800 at the recommendation of the uh, facilities manager at Frontier and the superintendent to utilize a tie-in bond for the engineering for the underground fuel storage tank replacement design and permitting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 GF30. Thank you. Um, there's another ARPA request which is... Um, okay. In in the unfortunate case that that Furcog can't find another accountant, um, and I need to have somebody to cut checks and pay our bills, uh, do you want to appropriate? How much you want? I mean, it I I would be I would not sign a contract in excess of ten thousand a month to get us through June thirtieth would be thirty thousand, so. 25,000 hoping that I would spend you know 15 to 20 of it well hoping that you'd have to spend none of it because yes. <laughs> the how job much, gets how done much, how much would be how much would uh, for the fourth quarter how much is uh, about 20, I think it's like 23 fourth. and change okay so if they don't provide the services that money would be coming back to us I assume or if you don't, let me see, if you don't perform the services and you take money, that's called fraud? Maybe? Maybe. I'm not a lawyer. I would hate to. But you have to provide, usually you have to provide a service for collection of money. At a minimum, it would probably be breach, breach of contract. But yeah. So, so we may not have to use any, but you're looking to... In case we do, the 25000 allows us to keep doing business. Okay. So All right. I motion that we appropriate up to $25,000 in the event it is necessary for the town administrator to hire accounting services to get us through this. Seconded. Were you all done motioning? Yeah, because I, I couldn't come up with a nice <laughs> word. <laughs> you, you were going so strong there for a little I while. I was, and then the words that were coming next were not polite, so I stopped. Wow. For once. Wow. <laughs> it, took, it took you a year and eight months to do that, huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. All, right. all right, so you have a motion, an abbreviated motion, and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Three zero. Thank you. How's that? Great. Okay. Select board updates? I got nothing. Nathaniel? I, uh, I have nothing either. I wish I had nothing, but I think I have something with South County EMS, but I, I'll know more. I guess I'm going to a finance committee in Deerfield meeting on Thursday night, so. Well, see, there seems, yeah, enjoy. Huh? <laughs> I said enjoy yourself. So did they? Did you didn't you didn't get notified anything from the town of Deerfield about anything? No. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I Can mean, I knew that they were not satisfied with the budget that was presented, but beyond that, no. So can I ask you to call the Deerfield town administrator and ask them, um, ask the town administrator? And then could you email me there what they said about, they took a vote about limiting where the director could, or where South,
County EMS could go because they weren't covered by insurance or something like that. They said they they said that South County couldn't go to the SWAT training. This is the select board, not the finance committee said that? Well, there's two different. Th okay. The I'll ask the whole finance line. committee saying one thing about something else and the board of select board saying something about select the finance Deerfield finance committee reduced the South County budget request unilaterally so we have to talk about that or so we can understand and then South Deerfield Board of Selectmen had a meeting where I've been told that they said that South County could no longer participate in the SWAT because of their insurance didn't cover it or something. They're when was this meeting? Because we met Thursday afternoon and nobody mentioned that. Anyway, so so uh, if you could just that. ask about, if yeah. you could ask the Deerfield TA, okay? Yep. And and maybe it, maybe it's not been relayed correctly, okay. but I'm pretty yeah, sure that that would happen. Yeah. Okay. I'll follow up. That's okay. Anything else, Jeffrey? Um, just three quick things. Uh, Lauren mentioned that we're uh, putting out an RFP for the Village Center visioning pretty soon um, through ARPA funds. There's also going to be an RFP put out um, to hire an architect slash engineer to oversee the Graves Memorial work that CPA had approved a couple years ago. Yep. That's going out. And then work has begun um, renovating the restrooms in Riverside Park. Uh, and they're hoping to finish by the end of the month. Oh, wow. That's quick. Yeah. Nice. I mean, it's within the sort of envelope of the existing building. Yeah, so. but still. Yeah. Anything done in a month is quick. Yeah. 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 How long did it take to get your stuff moved in your uh, basement? Almost three months. Or you could hire this company and they could rebuild a building for you. <laughs> well, that's the difference of dealing with insurance. Yes, I yes, understand. All right, motion. I motion we adjourn. Seconded. Motion made, seconded to adjourn this fine evening fine mess. Evening. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. 30825. Thank you, FCAP.